Alright, there are many new things in Go 1.23, but having custom iterators is the most interesting one, especially for library developers. Iterators is a new language feature of Golang and it provides a way to iterate over custom data structures beyond slices and maps. Go 1.23 has new many features related to sequence iteration. However, we will only heavily focus on the range iteration feature by creating custom iterators. But what do I actually mean with range iteration? I mean the usage of the range keyword in Golang to iterate over custom collection types. So let's quickly have a look here what this actually means. So before Go 1.23, there were mainly three ways to iterate over things, right? The first one is simple loop counting. So let's make an example here. It's just looping over a specific range, right? So this is here the normal for loop as we've known, right? So this loop here just prints numbers from zero to nine. Then we have the simple slice loop. So if we declare here a simple slice of type string, we can iterate over the values by just using v and then range s. Right now v in this case would be the index, so let's change v to i in this case and then print it again. So this would only print the index for our slice, so in this case 0 and 1. And then we can also get the value of the specific element we iterate over. Right, So we can say i and v, and v in this case is the value and i is the index. So if we quickly run this code, everything should work as expected. And these were mainly the three things how we can use the range keyword in Golang, right? So to iterate over a slice and to retrieve an index, to iterate over a slice and retrieve the index and value, and to have a simple range iteration until a specific value. So the range keyword was mainly used for slices and maps, but now, with Go 1.23, we can define our custom iterators so that we can actually use this iterator with the combination of this range keyword. So a use case would be whenever you want to use the range keyword to iterate over a collection that is not a map or a slice, right? I personally think that you will probably not use this custom iterator that much if you are not a library maintainer you will more likely use custom iterators when you basically use this library that supports the custom iterators. Okay, nevertheless, let's quickly look at an example how we can simply define an iterator in Go. All right, to define an iterator, it is just a function that takes in a function as another parameter. And this function is mostly called yield, and it is of type function, and it always has to return a Boolean. Now I'm actually going to explain why this is the case here. Now this function can take in any arguments you want, right? Let's just say, just for this example, we say i, which is going to be an integer. Now obviously this parameter can be called whatever you want as well, right? Most likely it will be called yield, because in the end we reproduce something to this yield function. So we send something to this yield function. And in this iter1 function, for now, we are just going to have a simple for loop here to iterate until the number three, right? And then we want to call this yield function. Now, it is important to note that this yield function returns a Boolean, which pretty much just indicates that we've stopped looping in the iterator, right? So that really means that any for loop can obviously take in a early break or early return statement, and this boolean just returns then false, right? Because we've stopped looping. So we can say if not yield and then i, we just return. And that's pretty much it, right? You've now declared your custom iterator in Go 1.23. Now again, the yield function is just a function parameter, right? And we call this function inside of our if condition here. And overall, when using custom iterators, this yield function or this function parameter is basically just the body of our range. So I'll quickly show you what I mean actually by that. However, again, we just check if it returns false, right? Or in this case, if this condition is true here, we just end 
the iteration or end the for loop. And the reason for that is obviously every for loop again can contain an early break or return statement. So let's quickly apply this iter1 iterator. And we can do this by just saying range iter1. Now I receive an error here because obviously you should not get this error, but I receive an error because the language server is not updated yet for me. However, this will work in Go 1.23, right? So we can just print i here in this case. And now if we run this code, we will actually get 0, 1, 2, which is the expected output, right? So now we've actually defined our first iterator. And let's just quickly demonstrate here the early return, right? So we can check if i is equal to 1, we just say return. Now, obviously, this will work, right? And we actually have to do this if condition here, because if we do not do this and just call yield, we will actually receive a panic, right? And the panic is a runtime error, which states that the range function continued iteration after function for loop body return false. So that really means that this custom iterator continued and proceeded its execution. However, we had an early return statement here. So in the end, this iterator should behave correctly when we have an early return or early break statement. So let's quickly undo this. And to really demonstrate here the range keyword, in the end, the range keyword is just syntactic sugar right? Because I will show you what actually the compiler produces after like seeing this code or compiling this code. So in the end, range iter1 just invokes the body of our for loop here, right? That, that's basically it. And what we've got when we actually compile this code is that the Golang compiler optimizes this code. And in the end, we are just calling a function. We are just calling the iter1 function with another function inside and then we just return true, and in here we print i, right? So this is the same behavior here. So in the end, range is nothing more than syntactic sugar for custom iterators. So if we run this code now, we get two times the same result, which is pretty good. But if we return false here, obviously, we do only get a zero, right? So we get zero, one, two, and zero. All right, now hopefully this iterator, this custom iterator is now clear to you. So let's quickly apply this to the love of functional programming. Oh, and before I forget, this iter1 function is not a blueprint, right? You can literally do whatever you want with it. So you don't have to necessarily loop over some number or some slice, right? You can do whatever you want with this kind of yield function with this parameter, you can define whatever arguments in this function you want. The only requirement is that it should return a Boolean. All right, so what we will do now is to create a map function, right? So a map function in the end just maps over the elements of a slice. And then there is some transformation going on, like we are doubling the numbers, for example, or transforming some sort of string slice. So let's quickly do this. Let's create a type alias, which we will call slice. And this type alias is of type in slice, right? And then we can simply define a function on this type alias. And we will call this function map. And in here, we will not have a yield function, but we will have a transform function. And this function just takes in an integer as a parameter and returns a new integer. So in the end, this transform function basically just takes in an integer and produces a new integer. So this is the typical transform map function. And obviously we can make this more generic, but I will keep it simple here. And in the end, this map function returns a iterator, which we can define as iter.sec. And then the generic argument here is integer, right? And if we hop into this type definition here, we can actually see that this type, this sequence type, is just a function with a yield function that has some sort of v value, right, or v function parameter, and always returns a Boolean. So this is the kind of iterator definition here we can make use of. So we will return this sequence for our map function, right, because we want to have an iterator in the end we can iterate over. And now in this map function, we will just return this iterator. 
So the new function sequence here. So we will say func. And then we have the yield function, which takes in an integer and returns a Boolean. And now in here, we want to iterate over the values of our slice, right? So we can do this because in the end, the slice type is an integer slice, right? So we can just simply iterate over the slice to get the values, which in the end is again an integer. And in here, we now apply the transform function. Right, so we can make this a beautiful one liner. So we just do the simple yield check, right? So if there is an early return or early break statement, we want to kind of return here and end this loop iteration. And in the yield function, we just call the transform function with the value of v, right? So this might look more complex than it actually is. But in the end, this is now our custom iterator here, right? We've just returned it as a function and in the end as a sequence type. And in this iterator or in this function, we just loop over the slice of the values of our slice. Then we call the yield function, which will in the end invoke the range body. And if it basically has an early return statement or break, we just return here. And the important thing is obviously that we call the transform function, which in the end is just a map function. And we just pass in here the value v of our slice. So this will now work, hopefully, right? So let's get back to our main function and let's make use of this map function. So we will now create a slice type, right? And in here, we are going to say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to have just some numbers. And then we say doubled. And now we can say numbers dot map and dot map now requires our custom dot map function now requires a transform function and we can say here func and for now we just return i times two right so in the end we just want to double our slice numbers and the cool thing is that we can now iterate over our doubled numbers so we can say n and then range doubled and we can print here n so if we test this code everything should work as expected. And we actually got the doubled numbers, which is pretty cool. Again, this code will be in the end optimized to something like this, right? So we call doubled and then we call this function. And in this function call, it has another function, which returns a Boolean. And then we return true. And here we just say N or I in this case, right? So this is the same thing as this. And that's pretty much it. All right, so let's quickly recap the map function again here. So what we got is the simple map definition with a transform function, right? This is just a function parameter, which we can call as a function. And in the end, this here, this func i, where we have the logic for doubling the numbers, this is the transform function. And in the end, the map function returns a sequence, which is of type integer. So it is just this custom iterator. And here we return now a custom function, right? Which takes in another yield function. This is by the way here an anonymous function. Again, yield is just here to produce the values for our iterations, right? And it kind of controls also the iteration. And this yield function just takes in an integer and returns a Boolean. And then we loop over our elements of our slice, which will be all integers. So in this case, it will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we call the transform function on v, which will be in the end i times 2. So it might be for 2, 4 in this case. Right. And then we will pass in four into the yield function. Yield function just invokes the body of our range iteration and it checks if it returns false or true, right? If there is an early return statement or break statement. And if there is one, we will just return early here to just prevent any panics. Now we can obviously make this here more beautiful by just saying transformed value and then transform V right to have the transformed value and then we can also say like stop iteration and then yield and then transform value right and in the end 
we can say something like stop iteration, right? Something like this. Like I said, this is not a blueprint. You can do whatever you want with it. And I think there are a lot of use cases where you actually want to apply custom iterators. Right, one thing that I actually wanted to mention is that there is not only a sequence, but there is also a sequence two, right? Or a sec two. So right now we cannot get the index of our doubled numbers, right? Because we kind of restrict our doubled numbers, our custom iterators to only have one return parameter of the yield function. And there should be also some kind of way to get the index of our iteration, right? Of our current element. And this is where the type sequence2 or sec2 for short comes into play. Let's quickly make use of this so we can say iter.sec2 and now we get a lot of errors, which is expected. Because in the end, sec2 now requires two parameters for our yield function. Right? You can think of, like I said before in the beginning, you can think of that when you want to get the index and the value when ranging over a slice, right? This would be a sec2 use case. So we can say int int, for instance, and then the yield function, like I said, just takes in two integers. And then let's just get the index here when we range over our custom slice. And in here, we transform the value V again, but the first parameter is also I. So this would be a sec2 use case. Right? So what we got when we now run this program is obviously not the expected output, right? Because now n is obviously the index and not the transformed value for our slice. So what we can say is just i and then v and then we can print it like this. And now we actually get the expected output, right? So you can experiment with sec1 and sec2 to basically have two different types of custom iterators if you want to. Now I highly recommend to implement on your own the filter and reduce functionalities when it comes to functional programming, right? Especially when you implement the reduce function, things will become more clear when it comes to custom iterators in Go. Now iterators might look confusing in the beginning, but I think they are really easy to understand, especially when you know what the range keyword actually does and what the compiler actually optimizes based on the range keyword. Now, if you also want to know what has been changed for timers and the sorting functionality in Golang, then I highly recommend watching this video here. Now, these changes are pretty helpful and critical to understand as well. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day and bye bye.